Each year, the American Spectator has presented an award to a member of the Working Press Corps for outstanding journalism. The award was renamed after several years in 2002 to honor our friend and colleague Barbara Olson, who was, of course, tragically killed on September 11, 2001. The list of recipients included in your dinner program is truly an outstanding group of journalists. We are honored this year to add a true hero of the conservative movement to that list, Mr. M. Stanton Evans. Stan has served as the editor of the, Daily, the Yale Daily News, written for National Review, Human Events, The American Spectator, and countless other papers and magazines. He edited the Indianapolis News, was chairman of the American Conservative Union, president of the Philadelphia Society. He served on the board of trustees of ISI with me. Um, he's written nine books, and the 10th on the 1945 Yalta Conference will be published during the coming year. Perhaps most importantly, he's the founder of the National Journalism Center and served as his president <laughs> until 2002, training literally hundreds of young aspiring journalists, many of whom are now scattered about the country in positions of importance and influence. For his contribution to America, to journalism, and to the conservative movement, it is my great honor to award the American Spectator's Barbara Olson Award to Mr. M. Stanton Evans. Thank you, Al. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. Um, I am very pleased to be here, and for many reasons. Um, and just in a preliminary, I don't want to politicize this. Um, well, I did have a chance to chat with Mrs. Perry and uh, with her good friend and my good friend, Diana Denman. And I, something that's not known is that I am a Texan. I am from Texas, native of Texas. So it's great to talk about some of the little towns in West Texas that we all knew about. And Texas, as you may know, and Senator Sessions, you know that Alabama shares this honor also, is different from Washington. <laughs> there, are, there are many differences. But the one that sums it up best for me is that in Texas and Alabama and some other states with which I've been connected, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms is not a bureau. <laughs> It's a way of life. And, uh, and one more political note with Congressman Ryan here. I can't resist this. I have to put forth my thoughts about the Obama health care law. I feel, Congressman, that it is necessary to repeal the health care law. Thank you. Thank you very much. In order to know what is not in it. <laughs> and I say that because even Nancy Pelosi said we would know what is. I still don't know what is in it. But I do know this, that if we repeal it, whatever is in it will not be in it. <laughs> so I share that with you free gratis to add to your <laughs> congressional agenda. Now, um, it's great to be here uh, with so many luminaries and uh, so many good friends of many years. Uh, and uh, in particular, Al Regner and Bob Terrell, both of whom I've known for a long time. And I've known them since they were very young men. And I've always thought this, that anybody who has his head screwed on right should be conservative when he is young. And then, as he grows older, gradually become more conservative. <laughs> and I think that, I think, I think that has been the case with uh, all of us. Uh, 
Uh, and I hope for the young people in the room that it will be the case for you as well. Now, uh, reference has been made to the election of 2010, and Al and, and uh, Bob heard me refer to this this summer at a dinner we had at the press club. Uh, the election of 2010 saw in the nation a resurgence of patriotism, uh, religious faith, love of family, individual liberty under a system of constitutionalism and limited government. In other words, an atmosphere of hate. <laughs> um, now, now, it has not always been that way. There were times when the embers of hate burned very low. Back in the 60s, Hillary Clinton, I think, in referring to the American Spectator, among others, but principally of the Spectator, referred to a vast right-wing conspiracy. And she was, of course, correct. <laughs> there is one, and we're all part of it. But back in the 60s, it was only half vast. Um, if that, I'll wait on that a little bit. Uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of things to worry about. We did not have uh, the kind of firepower and the energy that exists today. Most notably, we emerged from the election of 1964 uh, pretty well knocked flat. Uh, I think Barry Goldwater carried five states, if I remember correctly, in that election. And there were many, many uh, editorials, um, uh, understandably so, about the death of conservatism. Then yeah, it didn't exist anymore. It was over. And it was painful. And we really took a beating, and we had to dig our way out without much media assistance. And beyond that, Back then, and some of you youngsters may find this hard to believe, we had no grief counselors. <laughs> I'm serious. It was a totally, totally different world. And uh, well, I, I don't, you know, and I'm an old guy. I like to go on about the way it used to be and the way we, but there were, for example, just to pick something, we had no remotes for our TV. <laughs> so if you want to change the channel on your TV, you had to get up out of your chair and you had to walk over and, you know, manually change it. I mean, it's almost inconceivable. And I remember <laughs> that the other thing I could go on, uh, the malls, the malls were not covered. <laughs> so if you went out of, say, the Gap, the Radio Shack, you were outdoors. <laughs> it could be raining or anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> my point is, we were tough people. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, and of course, we didn't know any different. It was just the way it was. So, but anyway, it was in that, that atmosphere of the post-64 debacle that the American Spectator was founded. We did not have then, uh, there was no talk radio as we know it today. There, were no, there was no Fox News. There were no really alternative circuits of communication. American Spectator was one of the first. In fact, it was founded under the Alternative Educational Foundation, as I remember. When Bob and his group founded The Spectator at Indiana University in 1967, I was the editor of the Indianapolis News, and I sort of worked with them, and I tried to restrain them from all the mischief that they're <laughs> causing for the administration there. Uh, and. We all, I think, were kind of nourished by Indiana, which is somewhat like Texas and Alabama. There are some cultural overlaps here. 
And um, I kind of cut my teeth as a journalist on covering the Indiana legislature. And George, George Gilder is here, is he not? George heard me, I think I told this uh, story at the Philadelphia Society a year ago. We had um, a legislature that actually did try to legislate the value of pi. Now, Alabama has gotten some credit for that, Senator, but I looked into it and it was really Indiana. Um, and that's okay because I feel, you know, comfortable in either state. Um, but it also had some other attributes which kind of went along with legislating the value of pi. And because I was the editor of the paper, some of the more conservative members of the legislature uh, foolishly thought I knew something about what was happening politically, which most of the time I didn't. But there was one guy in the legislature who was on the budget committee, got part of an insurgent slate that got elected in 1972 in southern part of Marion County, which is where Indianapolis is. And his name, I'll use a, a fictional name, he was State Representative Vernon Wormer. And he was a tool and die maker who got elected on this slate of insurgents. And he didn't know much about, he was a good conservative, but that was his main attribute and a very important one it was. But he didn't know much about legislation. So he'd call me up like every night and almost always in dinner time. My wife would say, it's Vernon Wormer. <laughs> so I'd talk to him and he asked me stuff. And one night he called up and said, Stan, have you ever heard of something called National Endowment? for the human itties. <laughs> I said, human, human itties, uh, humanities? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> I said, they're trying to bring us in down at IU, down at Indiana University. He said, I don't like the sound of it. <laughs> I said, Vernon, I don't either. I said, it's federal money. We don't need that in Indiana. He said, well, we've got the college presidents coming in on Thursday. I'm going to ask a question about this. I said, good, you should do that. I said, remember, Vernon, it's humanities. <laughs> Whatever. And so that's, that's like Tuesday. Sunday, I pick up the Sunday paper. Bob, you may remember there was Sunday Star had a feature called Behind Closed Doors, which was written by a guy named Bob Mooney, a good friend of mine. And it was sort of gossip about the legislature, what was happening behind the scenes and so forth. And I opened it up and I look at the headline. There's a headline there uh, saying, spelled out phonetically, quote, what's this here human itties? <laughs> and the story said, the story said, Bob, you would like this because uh, the president of IU was there at the time. The presidents of all four state universities, which would be Indiana, Purdue, Ball State, and Indiana State, were stunned Thursday morning at a budget hearing when State Representative Vernon Wormer demanded to know, what's this here human itties? And I pictured this in my mind's eye of the presidents of all four state universities sitting there in the budget committee hearing, trembling <laughs> beneath the steely gaze of State Representative Vernon Wormer, <laughs> knowing that their budgets depended <laughs> upon his slightest whim. And I thought to myself, yes, <laughs> this, 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 this is as it should be. <laughs> this is America, pal. <laughs> Get used to it. So you can see that the mindset and philosophical framework uh, of, of legislation in Indiana was a bit different from Washington, and it was also that atmosphere that nourished the American spectator 
uh, and brings us here this evening. And uh, so I wanted to just share that and uh, uh, background with Bob and all of you. And finally, to say a word very briefly about Barbara Olson, whom I first knew as Barbara Brasher. And it is so sad that she was taken from us at such a young age. She was a unique combination of brains, beauty, and commitment. And I remember she came to prominence nationally during the Clinton, when, when you were persecuting Clinton, Bob. You may remember that. Poor Clinton. And uh, uh, I don't know how many of you remember the Charles Grodin show. Do you remember that? This actor who for about three years had a cable TV show. He was a piece of work. And he had this real whiny delivery. And he was always defending Clinton. And he said, why are all these women with long blonde hair criticizing the president? And he was right. There were several of them, Ann Coulter and Barbara and, and some others. And I thought, you know, that was an angle that I had not really thought about. <laughs> That, a unique, unique insight on the news from Charles Grodin, and uh, Barbara was in the forefront of that, that trend, whatever caused it. And uh, she was a, a very special person, and I'm therefore um, very gratified to receive this award in her name. She proved that having a beautiful profile does not exclude having a profile in courage, which she had bountifully. I'm honored to be associated with her legacy and her example. I thank you for giving me this award, Bob and Al. I thank all of you for uh, your attention. My time is up. Thank you for yours.